Hello, I'm Maria Williams with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls and webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Che EDC Strategies Partnership webinar, which is titled, Characterizing Multiple Chemical Exposures Among a Demographically Diverse Population of Pregnant Women in San Francisco. Our moderator today is Cheryl Patton, Director of the Commonweal Biomonitoring Resource Center. We will leave time following the presentations for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentations. After the presentations, our moderator will read out questions for our speaker to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 40 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Charles. Thanks a lot, Maria, and thank you everyone for joining this call. It's a very important one, I think, and thank you especially to Dr. Woodruff and Dr. J uh, Roy Girona for giving presentations for us today. I'm going to do a very brief introduction just to talk a little bit about how biomonitoring studies tend to address the presence of a very narrow range of chemicals in human biospecimens, mainly because assays for these small range of chemicals are well established and accessible, and there's a history of research based on these assays. But we all know we're exposed to thousands of chemicals in air, water, soil, household products, and so on. One estimate suggests that our chemical body burden consists of about 6,000 6, industrial chemicals. So how do we test for these chemicals when we don't quite know what they are? This webinar will address this question and explain why this question is of critical importance to our well-being. Professor Tracy Woodruff is a recognized expert on environmental pollution exposures during pregnancy and effects on prenatal and child health, as well as their innovations in translating and communicating scientific findings for clinical and policy audiences. Before joining UCSF, Tracy was a senior scientist and policy advisor for the US EPA's Office of Policy. Roy Girona uh, is assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. He currently runs a clinical toxicology and environmental biomonitoring laboratory and the TB hair analysis laboratory at UCSF. His laboratory has also pioneered the development of suspect screening analysis of environmental organic acids and serum using liquid chromatography and cryopole time of flight mass spectrometry. Now, he's going to tell us exactly what that is if you didn't get a chance to uh, hear what all those syllables actually mean. So, Tracy's going to begin the, the, the call or this webinar briefly, and then we'll go to Roy and then back to Tracy, and after which we'll open up for questions. So Tracy, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Cheryl, and welcome everyone to the webinar. I'm going to give a brief introduction, um, which will cover a little bit of the similar territory that Cheryl just covered about why we have been working on this project to try and advance our methods for being able to screen a larger universe of chemicals uh, particularly during the prenatal period. So the concept of the exposome was introduced in 2005 by Christopher Wild. So there has been a lot of efforts, including, including at UCSF, to, to map and understand the genomic contributions to disease, but we have far less understanding about the exposome contributions to disease, including um, the totality of human environmental exposures, particularly during conception, since that's a a very vulnerable period of development. Um, we have shown previously through biomonitoring studies that we have done both at UCSF and also looking at uh, national surveys, uh, particularly through the NHANES, that we already know through targeted biomonitoring studies, basically studies where we, uh, the researchers identify the chemicals they want to measure and develop a method for that, uh, that women, pregnant women across the United States are exposed to dozens of different industrial chemicals uh, from a variety of sources, often at exposures that we know are risks for developmental outcomes, including uh, neurodevelopment, adverse pregnancy outcomes, um, and male reproductive outcomes. Um, so we're interested in understanding more broadly the chemosome, 
which is the chemical component of the human exposome. Because as Charles noted, there are many more chemicals that are used in commerce than we are currently uh, covering through targeted biomonitoring approaches. So there's about 8,000 high-use chemicals uh, in the United States. That's a high-use chemical is something that's produced or imported in uh, greater than 25,000 pounds. Uh, we only have methods for about less than 3% of these chemicals uh, in terms of targeted methods. So USN Haynes covers about 350 chemicals. But there's, whoa, I'll go back. There's uh, a lot, much larger, as you can tell, universal chemicals that we could be exposed to because they're in high use. So the goal of this study and the work that we uh, embarked on with Dr. Girona was to develop better methods for characterizing the pregnancy chemosome and to help prioritize chemicals that we should be covering through more targeted biomonitoring studies. Um, so this is, talk, is going to talk about our first efforts in doing that, which was published recently in Environmental Health uh, Perspectives, which is a suspect screening method for characterizing multiple chemical exposures. Uh, and we do this from a population that we've recruited here at two of our clinics at UCSF, one here at Mission Bay and the other at uh, Zuckerberg uh, San Francisco General, which uh, covers a very diverse group of women, both economically, racially, and um, ethnically. And I would just acknowledge also the other authors, in particular Alan Wong, who's our postdoc, who was the first author, Jackie Schwartz, Thomas Lynn, Marina Sirota, and Rachel Morello Frosch. And now I'm going to turn it over to Roy, who's going to talk about the uh, methods that were used in this study. Thanks, Tracy, and thanks everyone again for uh, joining us in this webinar. I think in the last 30 years, uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry, have been used uh, pretty much by a lot of biomonitoring groups and uh, clinical labs to uh, do what's called targeted testing. But as uh, Tracy and Charles mentioned, uh, what we really are interested in this particular study is uh, called suspect screening. And for that particular uh, purpose, we have uh, a slightly different uh, flavor of mass spectrometer. So for suspect screening and non-targeted analysis, we use high-resolution mass spectrometers. Uh, there are two most common types that are currently being used by biomonitoring labs. One is quadruple time-of-life mass spectrometer, and then the other one is the Orbitrap. Uh, for the study that we did, we, are, we have used the quadruple time-of-life mass spectrometer, so I would rather focus on, on this particular platform in our presentation. Um, QTOF is typically uh, used in tandem with chromatographs, so you can either use a GC or an LC, and just like any other mass spectrometer, separation in this particular platform of molecules is achieved by ionization, and then they are sorted out by mass. So really the mass spectrometer is um, measuring mass to charge ratio that is equivalent to the molecular weight of that particular ion if you are only looking for uh, those with charge state of one, which is what we did for this particular study. Um, the, the key to the uh, ability of most laboratories to do non-targeted uh, screening now is this uh, advances that have been going on in high resolution mass spec in the last 10 years. And really, because of these advances, we have the ability now to measure masses at the sub two parts per million accuracy. This has allowed an ambiguous assignment of formula to measure masses, which ther therefore helped in what uh, we call now non-targeted analysis. For non-targeted analysis through high resolution mass specs, uh, there are actually two separate uh, steps in, in the analysis. The first step is what we call data acquisition, what is, that is when the machine is actually acquiring all the masses uh, for, for the analysis. And then later, that particular uh, step produces what's called the chromatogram, a total ion chromatogram is what we call it in the laboratory. Um, and then we do the data analysis on that total ion chromatogram. Now, data acquisition can be done in a targeted or non-targeted manner. As the, as the term implies, uh, for targeted, you have uh, practically an a priori knowledge of what you're looking for, and that is only a, your interest practically in doing the analysis. So, for example, you would like to look for bisphenols in your sample. For non-targeted, of course, you don't have any bias for what you're looking for. Practically, what you want to collect is all the masses or the, all the ions that can be produced from molecules in a uh, sample. 
Now, once you've done targeted uh, anal uh, data acquisition, of course, the only uh, available analysis that can be done for, for that particular acquisition is data analysis, and that's what we call targeted analysis. So, um, although high resolution mass spec specializes on non targeted analysis, uh, it is also possible to do targeted analysis uh, for high resolution mass specs. What we are interested at in this particular study is the analysis of data acquired from non targeted data acquisition. And for that, you can do what's called targeted data analysis uh, from uh, masses that are acquired in a non targeted manner. And here, uh, Typically, you would have a larger universe of chemicals that you're interested at, which then you can uh, put together in a database that can, you can then use as a reference for, for doing the data analysis. Um, or you can do a totally unbiased uh, data analysis as well. Um, when you use a targeted database for data analysis on data that is acquired uh, in a non-targeted manner, you do, you're doing what's called suspect screening. Um, and the end result of the analysis practically is not a confirmed compound, but a suspect candidate that that particular compound might be in a sample. So just to reiterate and basically uh, hone in the requirements for this type of analysis, for targeted analysis, you need to have a reference standard of uh, the compounds that you're interested at, and that will give you the retention time, which is acquired through chromatography. You look at the, both the MS and the MS-MS data, and you look for matches for, for all those data points in your sample. So again, the acquisition is targeted, the analysis is targeted as well. For uh, suspect screening, uh, prior information is available on your um, uh, compounds of interest, but you don't have the reference standard available for those compounds. So here, the acquisition is non-targeted and the analysis is targeted, and again, for non-targeted analysis, you have no prior information available whatsoever, and, and both the acquisition and analysis are non-targeted. So what we have uh, done in this particular uh, study is to do what is called suspect screening. So what is key to, uh, there, are, there are obviously two uh, key um, ingredients to uh, what we need for uh, suspect screening to be uh, successful. Obviously, you need a, a high resolution mass spec, which will allow you to generate the mass peaks from your samples. In this particular case, uh, we use human serum samples. And then the other key ingredient is the database, which you put together according to what specific classes of compounds you're interested at. In, in, in our case, we're interested at um, what we call environmental organic acids, which is, I would elaborate in the next slide. Um, what you get from basically uh, an initial data analysis of the mass peaks are called detected sus suspect features, which are really uh, features obtained from, from the mass spec, a combination of the retention time and uh, the ma accurate mass uh, that you pulled out from your sample matched to the exact, what we call exact mass of candidate chemicals in your database. And then, as I've said, because in this particular case, uh, the end product is really just a suspect compound, you still really need to confirm uh, that particular sample in order, or that particular suspect in order to make sure that that uh, compound you're saying is in your sample really exists in the sample. So for, for suspect feature detection, uh, we do have uh, criteria to say whether a specific feature, and again, a feature, is practically just a combination of the retention time and the accurate mass of the compound that you saw in your chromatogram. So there are criteria to actually accept whether that, that particular feature could have a match in your database. And for that, we look at the mass tolerance, which is a, practically the, the mass error we tolerate for, for the accurate mass. Uh, in this analysis, we did uh, 10 parts per million is our acceptable uh, criteria. In, in, in the analysis that we did, because we are looking for environmental organic acids, the carrier ion um, is a deprotonated ion uh, for, for the acid. Now, the retention time matching comes uh, during the confirmation, and typically uh, in the confirmation, we would use about 0.15 minutes as the retention time tolerance if, in order to say that the match we're seeing in the sample and the reference standard for the candidate uh, matches. 
So we also look at the isotopic pattern um, for uh, the specific uh, feature that we generate from the chromatogram. And so he, in, the, in this particular set of, uh, set of uh, criteria, you see the weighting that we do for what we call uh, a score. So each of those matches are given a score from zero to 100, and the distribution is based on the uh, mass score, meaning the, the agreement between the accurate mass you measured from the uh, instrument and the exact mass from, from the uh, database, and then the isotopic pattern, including the isotopic abundance and isotope spacing uh, that you generate for, for your particular uh, feature. Uh, we do filter the results so that we're not inundated with uh, thousands of results that are meaningless. And, and for our uh, filter, we do accept uh, 70 as our target score. That particular uh, score has been optimized based on a prior, previous method optimization procedure that we conducted in the lab where the target score 70 actually minimizes false positives uh, in our analysis. Uh, it froze. Okay, there. Um, so in this initial study that we did, we, we uh, analyzed 75 maternal serums using HRMS. As I've said, we generate the mass peaks uh, from, from those 75 maternal serum samples. Um, the database that we created, as I've mentioned, consists of environmental organic acids, which are really uh, uh, compounds that are in consumer products and uh, a, a significant uh, number of them uh, approximate the structure of what, what are called endocrine disrupting chemicals. So there are about 590 unique formulas in our uh, environmental organic acid database. Um, because some of them are isomeric, there are really about 696 chemicals that uh, represent those uh, unique formula. Uh, and here are the types of compounds that you can see in our in-house database. Now the database is up to you and up to what you are interested at uh, to look at in, in your sample. Although we're saying it's uh, non-targeted, really when you develop the method, uh, when we did this analysis, we, we first decided what particular compounds we are interested at. We developed this large library of compounds and based on the, the interest, uh, the compounds of interest, then we uh, custom made our method for high resolution mass spec so that we would increase the potential detection frequency of the acids. That is the reason why we're neg using a negative ionization mode because we're, we're interested more on the acids which typically ionize in the negative mode in high resolution mass spec. And so this is my last slide. So when we did the chemical analysis, the first step obviously is the running, running of the uh, maternal serum samples to generate uh, the mass chromatogram we uh, generated 5,317 suspect peaks. Those are the features uh, that I was talking about earlier. Uh, they represent about 248 unique chemical formulas. Um, when, when you actually do this analysis, uh, the, the, the machine would have the ability to screen for what would be a match, but uh, there are some garbage also in the data that is generated by the software, and that is the reason why you still have to uh, manually uh, look at the uh, total ion chromatograms that you uh, just generate, review them, and practically delete all those that do not make sense. For example, if the peak shapes are uh, really broad, there are multiple uh, shoulders in the peaks that you generate, and, and sometimes even the signal to noise ratio of the peak that was uh, determined by the uh, by the software is not even equal to three, which is our definition of, of limit of detection. So after the review of the total ion chromatogram peak, that 5,317 suspect peaks are then, uh, are then now uh, for about 4,610 uh, suspect uh, peaks, which represent 233 unique formula. And then I mentioned about isomers in our database. Uh, we do also have, uh, uh, an R program that was uh, 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 generated or authored by uh, Aline uh, to do ice, ice, isomer distinction. And so by doing this particular procedure, uh, we narrow down the 4,600 suspect peaks further to 4,236 peaks, uh, uh, basically representative of 230 unique formulas. Now, 
this 230 unique formula uh, is equivalent to about 282 suspect candidates. If you're wondering why there's more suspect candidates, that's because the unique formulas do not account the isomeric uh, compounds at which may share uh, the same formula. Now, once we have the suspect candidates, uh, the data analysis was applied, and here practically what we're doing is chemical prioritization. One of our objectives here is to really be able to discover new compounds to biomonitor. And so we, we, we used a priori criteria, such as uh, you know, the detection frequency that we're seeing uh, among this cohort, the toxicities of the compounds, their relative production volume, whether there are uh, differences uh, in their detection frequency and relative concentration in the different demographics of our cohort. The, we identified 20, 20 suspect compounds uh, with available standards and 16 unique formulas uh, from, from, from those 20 suspect compounds. Those standards were then bought and their uh, uh, mass spec and retention time characteristics were compared to what we're seeing in the um, in the uh, cohort to then confirm uh, six environmental organic acids um, from, from this cohort that we presented in the paper. Uh, back to Tracy. Great, thanks Roy. That was, um, let me see, very informative. I always learn something every time when you talk, so it's, thank you. Uh, so just to follow up a little bit more on some of the other information that we have um, as part of this uh, as part of this study, as Roy mentioned, we have uh, this. We started with a, a cohort of 75 women that we recruited at the two hospitals. So we collected maternal serum, which Roy uh, analyzed in his um, in the QTOF. But we also had um, administered questionnaire data to women. This was done during their second trimester. So we had information on both uh, some of the questions we asked were about consumer product use and demographics. So these are some things that were not in the paper, but I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, and we also had medical records and birth outcomes. So one of the, let's see what, so one of the features about this is that while we are, uh, have uh, the, the method has been developed and we're using it to, de to detect suspect features. We also have the ability to look at the relationship between uh, a broader array of chemicals and some of the both what are the potential sources of exposure and what there might there be re their relationship to uh, pregnancy outcomes. So part of the initial study was to characterize, to develop the method and to do more to characterize the um, chemosome of these uh, during pregnancy. And then a further down the road application is to look at what are contributing to these exposures and how may they be related to um, birth outcomes. So I'm gonna talk about the results that are in the paper. So this is, uh, Roy already alluded, uh, talked about the results that um, uh, in the flow diagram, but you can see that we have these different chemical classes that we looked at were part of the database that was put together for the suspect screening. Again, these are environmental organic acids. We had a relatively large number of pesticides as well as phenolic compounds, so that includes parabens um, um, and other uh, BPA and things like that. Um, we had some PFAS substances and phthalate metabolites. And you can see here that we found that uh, first of all, nobody's not exposed to chemicals, which we hypothesized to be true. The minimum number of suspects we found was 36. We had a mean of 63 and a max of uh, 82. And this is among our 75 women. So to give uh, uh, one of the things that we were interested in, as Roy talked about, is this prioritization and identification of chemicals that may be novel that we hadn't uh, uh, identified before in uh, particularly during the prenatal period. So we had a, um, a prioritization scheme to identify priority compounds for which Roy then ran, uh, bought the standards and, and uh, did the confirmation. Um, so this is, uh, some of, this is a group of the chemicals that we detected in greater than 80% of the women. They're ranked by detection frequency. Um, this is part of our prioritization scheme. And you can see that um, some of these chemicals 
Like it was very interesting because the uh, PFOS actually showed up as uh, being very highly detected. So I just want to say this method hasn't been applied before to bl uh, blood samples in this way. So uh, one of the things we we're interested in is it's finding things that we expect to be in the serum sample. So yes, that is true. We are um, finding these types of chemicals. So PFOS is found here. We have some phenolic compounds, phthalates, um, and phenols are the majority of what we're finding in these women. Um, on the right here, we identified whether they had been already biomonitored as part of NHANES. So as you can see, PFOS is already biomonitored as part of NHANES, as well as the California Biomonitoring Program. And then as Roy talked about, one of our priority um, items was, is this a, uh, produced in high volume? And that might one of our criteria or factors to look at in terms of identifying that as a chemical that we want to do confirmation on. So you can see some of these chemicals are also like this uh, orchard octophenol is already biomonitored and is a high production volume chemical, but something down here like these two isopropyl um, isoproxyphenol and uh, these two right here are not currently biomonitored, so those would be priorities for us to um, continue to look at. Um, so about half of the matched chemicals had not been biomonitored. So that was a very, um, we anticipated to find some, so this was a very interesting result for us. So here is a summary of the, the um, Roy can talk a little bit more about this during the question and answer, but the confirmation process took quite a bit of time because uh, by the standard, not everything that we screen for in the suspect screen turned out to be confirmed. That's because there's um, many things that could look similar to these chemicals that might not be one, for example, an endogenous compound. Um, but these were the ones that we identified through the confirmation process. So um, these are the chemical names here. Um, and then we look to see, so this actually, is, I would recommend this database for people who are interested in understanding um, or looking for an aggregated source of information about chemicals and um, all the data that we have, even though it's limited, on where they're being used in production volumes, which is this EP, EPA CPCAT database. So you can see that we then look to see well, where, where, what type of um, applications have these chemicals been used in that we have information, um, available information. I will say the quality is variable. But you can see there's a range of personal care products, manufacturing, cosmetics, fragrances, some food additives, and pharmaceuticals. And then we looked up what available health information was we could find on these chemicals. Again, these are not um, necessarily uh, government vetted uh, information, but because, for example, this one, 2,4-dinitrophenol, um, had some very old data looking at it. Uh, effects on eyes like cataract formation and de genetic uh, defects. I think this one actually had been banned by uh, FDA um, for use in pharmaceuticals because of uh, this uh, health effects. Some of them were evaluated by uh, government agencies like IARC, so pyrocatic health, possible human carcinogen. Some had no information, which is something also we anticipate given what we know that a lot of chemicals have not been tested. Just want to note too that we looked at the production volume. So these two chemicals right here are produced in uh, between 10 to 50 million pounds per a year this, um, from the EPA uh, chemical data reporting, which is also a useful tool from EPA on terms of data about chemical manufacturing and importation. Um, the, uh, this isn't in the paper, but Roy, uh, then we actually we recruited 200 women. Um, we have data, the paper covers 75, but um, since the paper was published, we've gone on to um, analyze the data for the, all 200 women. We're seeing a similar median detection frequency of 48. This is just a map of the retention time and um, frequency is the size. So you can see there's a lot of um, sort of higher frequency chemicals in this area. And then, I noted too that another thing that was not in the paper, but something else we're interested in is looking at um, the relationship to sources of exposure. So we're seeing that possibly the number of personal care products used daily is associated with more detects of some of these environmental organic acids. 
but not necessarily household cleaning products. And then we've done some evaluation of relationship to some of these birth weight, and we see some moderate uh, relationships. But again, this is at a just to explain, this is an exploratory analysis because we're um, and the numbers are not uh, very large for this, but we want to eventually use this tool to help us get a better understanding about uh, ex the aggregate of exposures and their relationship to those sources and outcomes. So in summary, the suspect screening method was very viable and it provided a more holistic characterization of a broad spectrum of environmental chemicals and we were able to identify novel and what appeared to be relatively ubiquitously present compounds and it helped us prioritize chemicals for targeted method development. Um, you need a relatively large sample size for suspect screening, or I could talk about this a little bit more, but it's not quite always as sensitive as the targeted method. Um, and the so there's lower sensitivity compared to targeted method. Our chemical space was about six, which is about 700 chemicals. As I said in the beginning, there's thousands that are in high use. So one area for advancement is expanding the chemical space for monitoring. Um, so Future work is to broaden this chemical area. Um, the computational workflow is pretty intensive, so uh, there's a lot of activity going on um, just in this field in general and trying to develop better computational tools that deal with the large data amounts and adding more biological samples. I want to acknowledge all the study authors and our funding, which is uh, from US EPA, um, the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, some of our uh, collaborators are funded by Preterm Birth Initiative and March of Dimes. And again, Alan, who is the first author of the study. And we, um, the paper is available online. Um, we have a blog post about this if you want to read our lay summary. And we're also looking for postdocs. So with that, we'll turn it over to you for questions. Uh, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. I think this is absolutely stunning that this kind of analysis is now possible and really opening up the door to learning what other chemicals are out there that we're being exposed to. I have a, a question from Anthony Tweedell. Any clues where in the fetus non-persistent but constant exposure chemicals are found? So he's, where, he's I'm sorry. What, any clues about where in, in the fetus itself uh, constant chemicals that are yeah we're supposed to constantly or are non-persistent are found? Yeah, well, we have done some studies to look at uh, uh, chemical exposures in fetal tissue. Um, pretty much every tissue that we've looked at has measurable levels of chemicals. This is targeted methods. So we've done P uh, PBDEs, uh, BPA, and those are the two main ones. And we found them in the fetal liver, cord blood, during the second trimester, um, and not amniotic fluid, but also uh, placenta. So they're well distributed in the fetus. We've also measured these chemicals at birth, some of these chemicals plus more in birth uh, for cord blood. Some chemicals are more bioaccumulate in the fetus, but some don't quite. So the perfluorinated chemicals tend to be a little less in the cord blood at birth, but the PBDs are more, for example. If I may add to that, also it, it really depends on how uh, the chemical is metabolized. And so, I mean, the, in, when we did the study on, on BPA, the, the placenta has a lot of role on, on what actually traffics into the fetus or not, um, and whether it's the um, unconjugated BPA or the conjugated BPA that would finally end up in the in the fetus. So, the the, the way that our bodies metabolize these chemicals is a lot. Uh, of influence and what uh, transfers to the fetus from the, the pregnant woman. Okay, and I, ha I have a question. The suspect screening is so important, but it's very time intensive and resource intensive. Do you see this being used, utilized more by labs and are there resources to do this or how, how can this be shared more across the country? Because the information coming out of this is very definitive about what's going on in terms of chemical body burden. Tracy, do you want me to take that or? Yeah, go ahead and I can add. Yeah, sure. So, 
so it is true that uh, you know the expertise required is uh, not uh, very commonly found, uh, and that uh, it, it's also true that you you need uh, specialized platforms as well as what Trace has pointed out. There are uh, computational requirements uh, that are also time intensive uh, and and requires uh, specific expertise also uh, in, in in order to uh, implement. Um, Will we? Uh, uh, will there be a time when every biome monitoring lab would potentially have this approach in in the laboratory? Uh, probably that's uh, uh, a long, long time from now. But um, I think what what EPA has been doing and what uh, NIEH has, has been doing is to actually uh, fund centers that already have expertise to this that can then collaborate with smaller laboratories uh, that are interested in these types of approaches. And, and so that is one way of potentially making this particular resource available to a lot of uh, researchers in reproductive science and epidemiology and public health. Um, as to, yeah. uh, go ahead. Uh, well, I just would add that, you know, this was, people couldn't map the genome right away. You couldn't go to 23andMe and get your genetics. Not that I recommend that, but. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, I think there's a, you know, we have this technology, um, you know, it's slow now and people are working on developing and are refining the methods, but an investment in this could pay off quite large in terms of advancing our ability to use it more, you know, improve the speed and efficiency of it. Good. Yeah. Uh, tell me, what, what surprised you most about your findings? Did anything stand out that you didn't expect to find and, but showed up? Mm, well, so a lot of those chemicals I'd never heard of, so yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, what do you think? Well, and it's uh, it's been, I mean, actually, as that, as we continue to work through this, it's it's just like these names and um, and where they're used and how much they're used and like some of them had been banned because they caused cataracts. I mean, but they're still used in high volume. I mean, those are the kinds of things that, I mean, I think we know that this happens, but when you see it, it's still surprising. It's still, it's stunning, I think. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Can, uh, here's a question, Kathleen Atfield. Can you describe the chemical prioritization process you used, i.e. moving from 282 to 20 for confirmation quantification? Well, I, I, I Lori can add to this, but I, he described it as, uh, you know, we look to see, what was detected a lot, that was a big, I think that was probably our highest criteria was what did we find in, because there's a lot of chemicals that you just find like one or two hits. And so we wanted to pick something that, some things that we knew would, because we'd never, right, right, never done this before, would we actually find them? So uh, having greater than 80 um, detection frequency, 80% detection frequency was probably the most important. And then essentially that list I showed, which is also in the paper, we pretty much just worked down that list. And Roy can talk about it. It took a long time. There were a lot of non, non successes in this area. So. Right. So, so uh, as, as Frieza and I have also pointed in the, in the uh, webinar, the, the single most important factor is the detection frequency. So we rank them according to detection frequency, but to add some more texture to that analysis, we are also looking for demographic differences um, in terms of where we find these chemicals, and therefore, you know, if two chemicals have the same detection frequency, but one, um, one, uh, one chemical, for example, is uh, probably more uh, detected in, say, Hispanics than, than Caucasians, or if there's, there are those differences, then that particular chemical is uh, more prioritized. Uh, so those are probably the two most important ones. But then later on, we used other criteria to actually further scale down the types of compounds that we want to confirm. Among those is first, we, we looked at, uh, and, and Trace has also pointed this out, we look at their production volume, whether there's data for uh, toxicity uh, or non-toxicity of, of the suspect compound. Uh, we also look at where, uh, where are the sources for the compounds? Are they in consumer products? Because that's what we're really interested at. 
And then finally, whether or not a reference standard is available, because in, in some, in some of, in some, well, not in some, but in a lot of the cases, we would be very interested in a particular suspect, but there's no available reference standard. And, and in order to actually custom synthesize the reference standard, can cost us about thousands of dollars. And so that, that's also, that also factored in and what, uh, you know, eventually limited the list to about 20 compounds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, here's a question from Patrick Devine. The compounds identified were, were still biased based on the database and the specific methods. How much more work would it be to expand the suspect search further? Yeah, I, I think I pointed that out. We we're calling this non-targeted screening, but but really, you know, if if you depending on what you would impose as the meaning of non-targeted, uh, really what what this particular analysis is all about is practically just broadening the 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 surface of uh, the space of chemicals that you can analyze for simultaneously, uh, rather than targeted uh, analysis where you you know for panels typically you have about 10 to 15 compounds. So there is bias. Uh, and, you know, uh, as, as I've said, for we, we were looking at uh, consumer products. Uh, we found that the similarity amongst them are, uh, they are mostly acidic or phenolic. And that's the reason why we, we came up with a database for environmental organic acids. That as a starting point then led basically uh, the uh, development of the method. So for example, in our, uh, in our mass spec method, we use negative ionization mode because that would uh, actually have a higher detection frequency for, for the acids. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, that's the end of it all. Obviously you can, and, and I think this is the expansion of the work, you can, you can expand the database or the universe of chemicals that you want to look at. Maybe you want to also look at amine containing compounds, which would ionize more in a positive mode. In that particular case, you kind of have to adapt your, your analysis. So we, what you might end up is to actually have multiple runs of, uh, of the sample. So one, one run maybe you would be doing in a negative mode to actually address the acids. And then in, in another run, you would be uh, running the uh, samples in the positive mode to address those compounds that ionize better in, in, in a positive polarity. And by doing that, you're you're actually expanding the universe of chemicals that you can then query later on when you do the data analysis. And, and a somewhat related question uh, for Roy from Daniel: Have you considered adding a GC to be able to detect the, the more nonpolar compounds like PCBs, PBDs, PAHs? And then also in the survey, was there a food frequency questionnaire since many of those compounds are also detected in foods? Uh, Tracy can ad address the food frequency questionnaire. Uh, of course, if I had several more millions of dollars of funding, I would add GC. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you're really limited by the resources. Uh, so you can, you can actually do a GC TOF or GC QTOF uh, for this type of analysis. There are papers that have actually been published uh, mm -hmm. using GC QTOF, uh, specifically addressing the types of compounds that Daniel has pointed out. Yeah, so we, we have a, uh, other um, questions in the questionnaire, including some issues, uh, things around food and, uh, you know, where, again, I think, as Roy's talking about, resources are a limitation along all aspects of the research pipeline, so where our patients are very indulgent in giving us their time, but we have to be judicious with how much time they give us, so. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, we we have a, we're still, there's a lot of data that's produced from this and that allows us to think of new creative ways to look at these issues in a more comprehensive approach. Yeah, and, and if I may add to that, so one, one good thing about uh, non-targeted data acquisition is that the data stays with you, which means that, as Tracy has pointed out, you can think of any, many other ways of how you would analyze the data. When we, when we actually acquired this data, we're, we're very interested on uh, environmental organic acids, which are uh, supposedly exogenous compounds. Mm -hmm. But really, you can, you can also query that data set or query your, um, your uh, total ion chromatograms that you generated using metabolomic approaches. So you might want to look at, okay, is there correlation between uh, certain exogenous uh, compounds like phthalate metabolites to 
um, may be metabolite, endogenous metabolites that ionize in the negative mode, for example, fatty acids. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there are, uh, one, you know, it might be uh, intensive in terms of resources that are required, but the, uh, the, the return of your investment is also huge in a sense that uh, the data can be used. Uh, if 10 years from now, uh, Tracy has compiled 1,000 uh, 1000 uh, patients or subjects in the study, and she has been using the same method of uh, data acquisition. All those data sets can be compiled together and requeried without necessarily running uh, the samples that you took 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge uh, development in terms of our ability to actually monitor uh, environmental chemicals in, 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 in humans. That is, that is huge. It's quite an accomplishment. Well, we're going to have to close. Uh, there are a few more questions, but it's time for us to leave. So I want to thank you again for, for this excellent presentation and also for your incredibly important work. It's, it's really a game changer, I think. And I, I uh, just want to congratulate you on what you've done and, and, and uh, express our gratitude from all of us for opening this door to chemical contamination of our bodies. Uh, Maria, do you want to uh, close formally this uh, webinar? Yes, thank you so much, Cheryl. We are approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on the CHE website soon, and tomorrow you will receive an email containing a link to the recording. CHE's next partnership webinar will take place next Tuesday, September 25th, and is titled Environmental Contributors to Cardiovascular Disease, Emerging Research on Metals and Air Pollution. CHE's next webinar from the CHE EDC Strategies Partnership will take place on Wednesday, October 17th, and is titled Preconception Environmental Exposures and Children's Health. To learn more into RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events and more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank Tracy Woodruff and Roy Girona for taking the time to talk with us today and Shell for her excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.